Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Okay, on the 17th of June 2020, I gave a presentation uh, called Are We Witnessing Something Strange to the Russian Cold Nuclear Transmutation and Ball Lightning Community. And at the end of that presentation, one Anatoly Klimov, an expert in plasma physics, he asked me a question, you know, uh, I see that you're presenting a magnetic model of these strange radiation particles, uh, some, sometimes called string vortex solitons or black evos, uh, a range of names, and uh, he agreed that they do exhibit that kind of behavior, and some of the presentations I've shown you this week also uh, indicate that that is the case. But he also said that uh, he had evidence that he was going to present that uh, uh, showed them to have uh, some electrical behavior as well. And he asked me, had I uh, observed that or did I want to discuss it? And um, so I actually didn't see his presentation until the day after um, because I had to go to somewhere else. But his pre presentation wa was uh, this one. And it's called Incredible Plasmatron Phenomena. And I will read through his uh, slides and then I will do my best to interpret them and give context with other uh, evidence in the field. HPG, which I presume is high pressure gas airflow, off. The grid potential plus 10 kV. Here we see a vertical erosion plasmatron. In the discharge gap of the plasmatron, a plate made of plexiglass is inserted, in which a small hole is drilled. As the current discharges and passes through this hole, a certain amount of plexiglass substance melts, is ionized, and increases the ion discharge current. Interestingly, this creates a clearly visible bright jet that resembles a laser beam. This plasma jet does not expand into the surrounding space as in a flooded jet, but keeps a very narrow shape. High pressure gas airflow on Mach number 2. Here we see a picture from an experiment where a powerful airflow from the side acts on the plasma jet perpendicular to it. As a result, the plasma jet is divided into three streams. Number one. The red stream slightly changes the trajectory of its movement. Number two. The white stream deflects perpendicularly to the plasma stream and moves along the side airstream. 3. The green stream moves in the opposite direction to the plasma stream. High pressure gas airflow off. Grid potential minus 10 kilovolts. This shows an experiment with the mesh as a cathode. When the cathode is fed with several kilovolts, the plasma jet does not penetrate the mesh and stops at it. This indicates that the plasma jet exhibits electrical and magnetic properties, perhaps not electroneutral. The velocity of the plasma jet reaches several kilometers per second. It's not easy to stop that flow. This task is easily solved by a cathode mesh with a voltage of several kilovolts. High pressure gas plasmoid traces. Strange radiation. Now he's referring to two aspects here. This is the capillary uh, discharge plasmatron. Uh, these are kind of the gases coming out that have uh, mixed the white and the green components. And these are the streaks. And he's noting that the streaks have strange trajectories. So you have one coming to here and it's splitting. In fact, it's splitting like that. And there's also 
interspersed splitting as well, it would seem. And then there is also this one that comes and bends through this coil, and this coil is three centimeters away from the head of the discharge unit, and it has a six kilovolt negative uh, potential applied to it, and uh, the, it's noting that the gun here is not horizontal, it's slightly raised. And I've blown up this area here, and I will talk about this more later, but you can see that the incoming particle has a spiral with a broad period. And then when it hits here, it splits into two principal components. You can see the uh, secondary ones. Um, but the principal components have a higher frequency, but are also a spiral. The one that's coming through here starts with a higher frequency. It uh, looks like two things orbiting around each other. These ones have lower fr varying frequencies as they're coming out, but uh, typically uh, sort of longer frequencies. In fact, this one looks like it's got two modes. It's got a broad frequency and then a, one that's half, half the frequency within that. High pressure gas plasmoid traces, strange radiation. Again, we have a ring. This ring now has 9 kilovolts and is twice the distance away at 6 centimeters. And he notes that there is a strange trajectory that is coming out here and then bends around at 90 degrees. So it starts to almost come back on itself. Here also there are some strikes. And presumably this is copper wire. And there is some apparent ionization or something going on. And you're having these secondary plasma sort of things occurring around it. On the last two slides, which I've shrunk here for you, you can see luminous tracks of bright particles periodically separated from the main plasma stream. Their flight is like that of a tracer bullet this is a macroscopic object which, as we can see, does not just move at great speed, but also rotates intensely. These objects are not subject to the Magnuson effect. And what that is, is if you've got an object spinning like this, which if you can imagine these, let's say, they are spinning like that, they are spinning like this, there is a force that moves up like that. So this is how a footballer might curve a ball into a net around the goalie or a uh, cricketer might uh, throw a ball and uh, curve ball it in to get to the stumps uh, and there in fact there used to be ships that used sails or uh, to <laughs> move themselves uh, by spinning a, a cylinder it's just not very efficient uh, but anyway um, it does not exhibit this. So what he is saying is that these things are spinning like this, and if they're spinning like that, you would imagine them to move uh, uh, relative uh, uh, to that spin uh, with the Magnus force. And do not deviate from the straight line trajectory. But sometimes they kind of explode and split into several objects flying in different directions. Sometimes these objects change their tra trajectory sharply, at right angles, which is completely unlike the movement of an erosion particle. And this last point is very important. These objects emit x-rays in the direction of their movement. So they are moving like this, let's say, coming out of the device, and they are firing x-rays ahead of them, which is quite interesting. Conclusion. Erosion plasmatrons provide a lot of information about Lena. In particular, it was shown that the energy balance does not agree by a factor of 2 to 4 when assessing the energy of the plasma jet in relation to the energy of the condenser, the discharge of which creates the plasma jet. The plasma jet always records the formation of aluminum, Aluminium, for the English amongst you. Calcium, which I've noted here are respectively the third and fourth most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. 
and other elements that are not in the material of plexiglass. These results were obtained in the 1980s, long before Fleischmann and Pons' report. The book Ball Lightning in the Laboratory, 1994, edited by R. F. Avramenko, contains a lot of data on erosion discharges, useful for our community. So, actually, you will see when I publish the video that uh, Klimov is actually holding on to the original uh, large format color photographic uh, positives. And uh, what you're seeing in this presentation are mobile phone captured uh, images. So the amount of data that's actually in those images is phenomenal, which you're not seeing here. But you can get a general idea of what was observed. The thing that it's saying here is that effectively there was a capacitor and that was discharged. And he also mentioned in his question to me that there was a magnetron involved, uh, or at least in his question to me. And it could be potentially that the, there was a magnetron, magnetron um, exciting some gas before the condenser discharged. And then that then went through this capillary, through the plexiglass, uh, to produce this extremely high kilometers per second uh, um, powered stream that it has three clear components to it. And uh, he's saying that the the power is a COP of two to four on, on this uh, uh, um, phenomena, and that uh, commonly observed uh, elements produced in low energy nuclear reactions were observed every single time this was conducted. And uh, it does not surprise me that always you saw these very common elements. It would be very, very difficult to say, oh, I'm observing oxygen in there because uh, oxygen is probably in the plexiglass or it's certainly in the environment. And, and silicon is the first and it's like everywhere. So, you know. <laughs> uh, so th there, there we have it. Now, I'm going to go and, and touch on a couple of these slides and then draw in some other data from the rest of the field that I think might be relevant uh, to you. Now, the first one here that looks like a lightsaber, I think this is fantastic uh, because uh, of its laser-like. And he's, he's right, it's coming out of here. So I, I think what you're seeing here is you're seeing the accelerating um, uh, anode potentially here, and there's a cathode and the discharge in there, and it goes through this plexi a piece of plexiglass that has this capillary in it. And then as it comes through it, it uh, um, strips off some of these ions, and, 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 and uh, so you get more ions in there, so it in increases the ion discharge current. And then it's coming up here, and it, it doesn't diverge much, but even when it goes through this mesh, and this is actually a fine wire mesh here, and you'll be able to see it more clearly, maybe if I change the contrast on here, you can see that a bit better. But you'll see it on the PDF, which will av be available uh, uh, in the description of this video. And uh, this has a potential of plus 10 kilovolts. So this is almost accelerating it further in this direction. So we, let's say this is an anode here uh, with our plexiglass in between. And um, this is now another anode. So it's kind of accelerating it. Uh, and it, it then goes in and you can see it's, it's, it's not diverging. In fact, it just looks like a rod. It looks like a lightsaber, which is very cool. Um, and so with a positive potential, uh, it just produces this beam. Now, what I think is quite nice about these photographs also is that you see on the back wall here, uh, it may be some black card that's in the background or whatever, you see a kind of like muted version of what's being emitted from here. And you can see the discharge gas here. And there's almost a round circle at the top here. Um, and then there's a, there's a split in there. And the, this is where the, the uh, shadow is from uh, the frame that's supporting this wire mesh. And then it, it, you then see the light coming from the, the beam that goes uh, beyond the mesh. And so this is quite an important piece of data that you can observe also. On this one, you can see that the this is the nozzle from the high pressure gas uh, output, and that is producing a jet of about um, a Mach two, uh, apparently. And this is causing this splitting into three components. 
And this, this component here, this yellow-orange component, it's, it's only just slightly deviating, and it really seems to be deviating when there is still a mix of gases. So maybe it's an interaction between uh, whatever this white component is and this green component with the orange component that causes that to deviate just slightly. And once those are mostly cleared out of the way, then the, the, the things just go uh, in a straight but slightly divergent path. Um, uh, this, for me, is a stunning, stunning component, and I will talk about what potentially we might be seeing there later on. Here, with this slightly up-tilted jet, you can maybe see that there's uh, potentially the green component here and the, 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 the white component here. And I talked a little bit about the, um, the, the uh, spiral forms in here. But one can imagine that as you see this bending down and then going straight through here, uh, and these are kind of all going straight, one, one can imagine that, that with the 6 kilovolt here going through this loop, that there may actually be some uh, um, uh, magnetic field around that, and that that may have played a role in influencing this. So one could say that this potentially has a magnetic component to it. And we discussed the magnetic component of strange radiation uh, uh, with the work of, of uh, Val uh, Valeri Zatalepin and his uh, torsion balance. And we're actually going to revisit that next week, and I'm going to focus uh, on the magnetic aspects of strange radiation and, and how that can be useful. Uh, this one has uh, the opposite potential here. It's further away, um, uh, and it seems that also you are getting some uh, sort of deviation here. Uh, it's literally going at 90 degrees or bending in a smooth curve. And we actually see these kind of paths in strange radiation tracks. So this is, this is something that, that is not unfamiliar to people who have been following uh, this kind of work. But you can also see that it does go straight towards it and, and split up. There's a bit of splitting up going on uh, even on, on this one. So the, the potential hasn't changed that much. Now, this slide I quite like um, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, but what it's suggesting is... Uh, that if we um, have um, uh, a potential of a negative uh, high uh, potential, um, we could potentially create a strange radiation shield. If these are strange radiations, like so, let, let's we say we're we're assuming that this is the uh, strange radiation particle particles, these uh, yellow orange uh, spinning components. Um, they don't seem, and none of those appear to be going beyond this. And, um, you know, you can see some coming off here. Uh, and it's weird because you've got one coming over this way and you've got one coming <laughs> that way and, 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 and others coming that way. But you don't see any beyond there. So uh, could a uh, high negative potential mesh be a means to stop strange radiation? And again, on this back wall image, you can see the emission down here. The beam and it really does just stop dead there seems to be a little bit of glow up here but it just stops dead and so uh, the three components is is uh, you know we, we, we do know that uh, exotic vacuum objects from shoulders work are meant to shed electrons and shed light now could it be some uh, electrons are provided by this high negative potential mesh that are able to reconstitute the atoms or or, or, or just break uh, some aspect of their property that, that uh, allows them to uh, continue. Okay, so now I want to talk about this image here, uh, which is a blow-up of this, and these uh, spiral components, the, the tight spiral of the one that's coming through here, and the uh, wide spiral here, and the fact it's going off in two directions. And I want to start by re referring to a paper that I've referred to a number of times this week, and that is the permittivity transitions uh, paper by uh, um, Ken Shoulders. And he has a, a couple of images, Fig 7 and 8, and it's talking about uh, how exotic vacuum objects do uh, like to, and they can, uh, form pairs. 
and so uh, this uh, one here and this one here and he describes it here in complex entanglement in many of the EV questions that have come up to date there is always the thought that they seem to have desirable properties for experiments along the line of quantum entanglement. There are photos of dual EVs shown in figure 7 and more complex behaviour shown in figure 8. All of this attests to the tightly bound nature of the entities. In the case of the dual EVs, they remain together even though they are boring through solid silicon carbide. The quickest way, and I'm going to come back to that in future presentations, the quickest way to separate them is to impact them upon a metal target. The slow death method is by injecting them into vacuum and let them untangle. An example of this is shown in figure 8. This is a side view taken with the particle camera where the exotic vacuum object source is located in the bottom uh, of the photo showing the EV launched into the vacuum. The helix uh, shown represents a gradual unwrapping of the dual EV ensemble. The total distance of travel is about one millimeter. Okay, now the interesting thing about metal target, I want to come back to uh, this one where it's stopping. Now, what is interesting about a metal? Well, it has free electrons. So he is saying the easiest way to stop them is to impact them upon a metal target. The metal is able to provide free electrons. I'm suggesting that this mesh is able to stop this uh, plasma in dead in its tracks, potentially because it has the ability to offer very, very, very many electrons. This really could be a way to look to stop these types of particles and perform experiments more safely. The other thing that I think is very, very interesting about this is it's coming from here and up to here and it's spinning around uh, in a particular direction and then it's falling apart. In this one, uh, it, it isn't doing that because it's basically being stopped dead in its tracks. Now, uh, what I notice about this, and if I change the contrast on that maybe, um, it has what I call an outie here and an innie here. Now, the outie always tends to be smaller and the innie is bigger. And we have seen this before. And there's another aspect to this that I want to refer you to. Look at the distance between the, the, the whole area here and the outside here and we'll draw that round and then look at the distance between this and the outside and draw that round you will see that these soft areas intersect with each other okay so we know this is an EV we know this is a dual EV uh, where have we seen this before well we have seen it in the lion experiment in fact multiple different lion experiments so this is one where it is uh, in the horizontal plane uh, in line with the B field and we've talked about this before but look at what you are seeing you are seeing one that is smaller which is the alti because you can see this is the back side and this is the <laughs> uh, top side so this is the back side front side this is on top but it's smaller this is on on the back uh, it's the back it's the, the back one and it's it's larger it's larger okay this is the same thing that we are seeing here. Smaller is the outie, and the, the bigger one is the innie. And I see this as the field that is going around like this. So there's something that binds these two together, okay? Now, if you were to consider what uh, is being said by uh, Anatoly Klimov, the, this structure, one would think, is firing x-rays off in the direction in front of its travel. So if this is coming in and hit this plate, it was firing x-rays towards the plate uh, before it hit it. And if that is the same as this, 
this, these structures and potentially all of the substructures within them were fire. It, it obviously came from inside the reactor towards this. It got stopped dead in its tracks, I believe, by the magnetic field. And it was firing X rays. Now, what do we know about quartz and discoloration of quartz? Well, if you want to change the color of quartz, you heat it up to about 600, 650 degrees C, and then you expose it to X rays or gamma. They often use cobalt-60 sources. And this can cause changes in the color of the quartz. So this may not just be transmutation. It may not even be transmutation. And I've discussed this before. But I'm now giving you this specific overall context of how this discoloration can have occurred. And in other areas of the Lion Reactor, you can see a wide range of colors. You can see canary yellow, you can see oranges, you can see greens, you can see browns. And these are all colors that are created using this process in natural quartz for creating kind of gem, fake gem colors. This is known in the gem industry, but you need to create high energy x-rays. So it is, in my mind, without a shadow of a doubt, that the Lion Reactor is creating exotic vacuum objects. And they have all of the properties and the forms and the structures of those that were observed by Ken Shoulders. And this is just a very large one. There are very many, like this one down here would be a very small one. <laughs> but this is a very large one. Okay, this is a big cluster of them, as we discussed in the previous presentation. Likewise, this one is a large one also. And what's so beautiful about this one is that you see the helicity. You see these hel the helicity of the structure. You also see that this is the small side and this is the big side. You also see that the large area, which is affected here and here, intersects. That intersects with that one, that intersects with that one, that intersects with that one, that intersects with that one. So this is consistent with what was observed by Ken Shoulders. And moreover, this is what I believe trapped this. And this is the B field is coming down here, but there's this bend in the wire. And we can see that a wire with electricity going through it interacts with strange radiation, as it has done here. OK, so we know that. And uh, I saying that the small one is what is the alti, and it comes through. And this wire was bent down on there. If you see the video where I take this apart, it's bent down on top of that. And the underside of this wire has no elemental deposits on it. The top side has elemental deposits on it, which are not in the wire. And they are helically deposited in the same helic uh, sort of formation as this. So this is, in my mind, 100% proof that the flux line of whatever is binding these two EVOs together is coming out of the small one and going into the big one, coming out of the small one, going into the big one, coming out of the small one, going into the big one, coming out of the small one, going into the big one. So if it actually Shoulders talks about moving these things apart and bringing them back together and, uh, you know, they can actually get quite far apart. But then once they in fact, they can split into thousands of little bits, which you're you're seeing it splitting into two there. But there's other bits here, but they want to be together. <laughs> And in fact, it's, it's self-similar because it's, it's come in here and it's spiraling and then it's come out here and they're spiraling. So the, the substructures that were in this one have then become a self-similar uh, um, daughter product, as it were. Where have we seen these kind of spiraling structures before? I can tell you now. We have seen them in 1986 in the Histalin ball lightning observations. And this is a static frame. It's a long exposure. And you can see the spiraling is getting bigger and bigger. And then it kind of disappears. Just what you are seeing here. And potentially what you could see if you had a higher resolution when you're coming up here. It's it tightly defined. And you'll see that this is actually more striped. Um, but it's more tightly uh, 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 defined. And it will be on the negative, or sorry, the positive that he has. This is also, I think, in the 2000s. Um, uh, uh, from Hestalen. And you can see that it's spiraling along here, spiraling along here, and it's slightly broken, and it hits this treetop, and then it gets m um, more broken here. Now, there are these black areas, and this is very interesting. What are these black areas? Well, um, we also see it here in this bull lightning that was uh, taken uh, by AID in Australia uh, very, very recently and sent to me. 
And this is the daytime shot with as best as possible he could get the same frame as this nighttime shot. And they're both in motion. And I have shared uh, all of this material uh, online. And it would appear that the ball lightning, which he says is about two kilometers away and about 10 to 20 meters in diameter, is observed through this very small gap in the trees. And he was very lucky. And he drives through this gate here and moves off to the right. So the actual thing appears to move to the left, but it could be moving away from him, uh, like from two kilometers to 2.1 kilometers. But what you see is a spiraling nature to it. Now, the thing is, in these cases, there's clearly two objects, right? There's clearly two objects. There's clearly two objects. But in uh, other cases, and, and in fact, in, in these cases, there are uh, clearly two objects. But what is going on in here, where it seems to be broken, and, and here, where it seems to be like only one side of two objects moving around, and, and potentially also uh, in the... Uh, thing here and what I've done here is this is a long exposure this is a long exposure this is 30 frames a second so each one of those segments is 1 30th of a second and the slight moving up and down is maybe the undulation in the road um, and, and the period here is uh, very regular now th there are dark spots this could be the um, uh, the uh, exposure on the camera or it could actually be uh, uh, you know, turning on uh, the sh open shutter and the closed shutter time, or it could actually be um, uh, where the, it's it's black on one part, like it's dark on one part here, like it's black gap here. It's like split. Now, what could that be? Well, I'm going to share this with you, which I've shared before, and this is uh, what I potentially am saying are black and white macros. Uh, uh, evos, okay. And what you've got is you've got like a yin yang pair. Um, so you, you have, uh, in this instance, in this instance, in this instance, you have one side is a black Evo and the other one is a white Evo and they are orbiting around each other. Okay, And here is a black Evo and light cannot possibly go through a black Evo Okay, uh, in this type of black Evo. So <laughs> it's, it's not one that's maybe lost all of its electrons. It's actually a different state of Evo. This is a white Evo. This is a black Evo. Okay, you can go and look at this and study it in your own time. This work was done at the um, uh, National Research Nuclear University in Moscow by Bogdanovich et al. Okay. And so what I'm saying is that maybe the one that's coming up here and the one that's coming down here are different types of structures that are created that may also be EVOs uh, or that there is a, a negative version of this. And um, what evidence do we have of that? Well, uh, this is a... Um, some material from, again, from permittivity trans, uh, uh, transitions of shoulders. And he says, there are negative, neutral, and positive entities. One of the things not mentioned is the likelihood of forming totally black organizations with ghostly properties and being able to operate without our being able to see them in any presently available way. One of the things that might be needed in constructing such an entity is the positive EV structure. And this figure here, taken from uh, his uh, permittivity transitions, in fact, it's from his book, EV A Tale of Discovery, shows an image of an early positive structure accidentally captured while looking for something else. The test for whether a structure is positive or negative is by using electrostatic deflection of the emitted particles from the entity being viewed. When a trace is deflected to the left, the particles are positive. Electrons deflect to the right. In the photo, the camera is looking at the end of a small capillary tube. Sounds familiar? Hmm. That had an electrical discharge emanating from it, producing the image. Hmm. Does that sound familiar? The small spot at the top center is either high-energy photons or high-velocity neutral particles. The white pattern on the right is a group of largely disorganized electrons, while the pattern on the left is both disorganized and organized positive particles. The trail leading from the center of the plume to the, uh, is typical of a negative EV trace, but this one is positive and it emits positive particles. So, <laughs> he's literally doing, uh, where is it? It says, uh, duh, 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 duh. 
he's actually saying electrons deflect to the right in the photo the camera is looking at the end of a small capillary tube that had an electrical discharge emanating from it producing the image what have we got here this is a small capillary tube right and it has an electrical discharge emanating from it and we have three components coming from that is what we are seeing in this ball lightning in this ball lightning and uh, these structures these black structures and in um, uh, the ball lightning from Australia are we seeing a ghostly black kind of negative version of a white evo rather than a, rather than an exotic vacuum object that has become dark gray and then black it's lost its electrons is are we actually seeing one that is black from the in it's a positive structure that's um basically orbiting around a, a white evo and creating these spiral forms that you see in this ball lightning i don't know maybe the other thing is that the orange structures you see here uh, i want to make a comment on um, because these ye yellow orange entities um, are in tune with ball lightning ball lightning is often yellow orange okay so uh, in fact that is what uh, aid describes all of his ball lightning to be it's like a yellow orange glow but he's seeing the uh, positive entity potentially is what i'm saying and that produces a yellow orange glow and that uh, i believe is because you have some kind of interaction with the gas that it's traveling through that creates this glow and what that kind of thing might be is that um gray evos and if they have a large densities of cold neutrinos these may interact with the electrons of the gas they pass through in this case the air uh, and, and they hand off some of their energy like making them glow yellow orange and this is because electrons uh, plus a neutrino can go to an electron plus a neutrino and ex essentially there's just a handoff of energy so an electron can share some of its energy with a, a neutrino and make a more energetic neutrino over here or vice versa if you want more energetic neutrinos it can pass some of its energy to the electron over here that would put the the electron in the gas to an excited state or the material in in an excited state and make it glow and here is a uh, reactor from me 356 that he shared a number of years ago and he showed that when he was getting excess heat i.e the he, he wasn't actually raising the temperature by putting more current into the uh, heater. He, he was just turning on a, a stimulation frequency, but maintaining the, the, pa the uh, temperature at a constant temperature. The, the input power was going down. He was just stimulating. But whatever was going on was able to, over a, over a very short period of time, cause the stainless steel outside of the heater, which, by the way, has not changed temperature, to start glowing yellow orange and then the last point i want to make here is that something similar was observed by uh, hutchison and i have this book here uh, called reality denied it's the latest book by john b alexander and in it on page uh, 141 i just want to read a exam uh, ex excerpt here and so it says in one sequence the film shows a rat tail file held between two wooden boards, exposed to the field produced by the Hutchison effect. The file illuminated just as a filament in an incandescent light bulb would. And most incandescent light bulbs are yellow, orange, uh, certainly the, the carbon filament ones. Uh, but of course, they can get very brighter than that. But anyway, just like a, a, an incandescent light bulb would. For a short time, the file glowed brightly, then broke in two near the middle. Though the wooden boards constraining the file showed no sign of burning, as would be expected. According to a witness at the experiment, as soon as the file split, they were able to reach in and pick it up with their bare hands. That alone is inconsistent with the amount of heat that would normally be generated to cause structural disintegration of the file. Now, I have given in another presentation, you can go and look on our 
um, YouTube site, uh, I have suggested that the way that um, uh, samples uh, break in this manner in the Hutchison effect is because you get uh, you have your bar here in this case a rat tail file and you have some evos uh, nucleated and they have a, a north here and a north uh, on the top side so you have like basically uh, you have our, these are representing our two evos and the north's on the top and the, the, the south's on the bottom and you get them to uh, uh, basically one's over here with its north facing towards the other one's north and they 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 grow and they grow and they grow in intensity until the magnetic field is so strong, it literally just splits the wire. But what's happening is we know that there's a spin going around this where there are substructures of exotic vacuum objects. And at some point, when they're getting very strong, they're going to start exciting the gas molecules in the air, just like you see in uh, uh, these yellow-orange structures here, and that you see uh, in these yellow-orange structures here, and in these yellow orange structures that you see in ball lightning. So there we go. Uh, I'm trying to join a couple of dots here for you. Uh, I uh, have got some uh, further reading for you here, uh, which you can go and have a look at. Uh, it's quite a fun book, this book. Uh, you can uh, go and consider getting that. Um, but um, uh, there are EVOs that cluster, and th there's uh, lots of substructures within this. And I've done videos looking at how some of the, the substructures that are actually spinning around in this massive structure are like self-similar versions of the overall structure. And uh, you can see that there is a core area here and an outer area here. There's a core area here and there's an outer area here. There's a central large spot and then an outer area here, you can see that here. So um, all of these things are the same. And in, in this case, you have something coming in with one period and it's much larger. Um, you can imagine it's conservation of momentum and, and, and then it hits here, splits into a number of these ones that here, but th these are splitting out this way. And th th these uh, have got a faster rotation, but they are born out of this one. So they've, as, as shoulders would say, they are electronic structures built at electronic speeds, but they have extreme complexity. And from when we look at them, it just looks like two things running around each other. But are they two things where they could be a positive and negative structure? And would this be able to explain why, um, for instance, in the Baranoff work, you couldn't see the, 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 the strange radiation that is coming out of the nickel hydrogen reactor that's able to interact uh, with the nickel uh, plate that has the magnets on uh, and to transfer its momentum, uh, its torsion to that and spin that plate. I think, uh, um, I, I just want to say something right now. I think that if there is a, a, a country that is serious about really understanding how nature works and they are not looking into this phenomena, which has evidence stretching all the way back to the, I would say, 1950s, and probably uh, to Tesla and, uh, in the modern era, I, I would say that they are irresponsibly spending their scientific dollars. I think the evidence now is so strong with what Shoulders has shared here, what Klimov has shared, uh, that Avra, Avra, what's <laughs> Avramenko had shared. And in, in fact, one of, the, one of the references I have down here was a document that was commissioned at the end of 2001, where the military in the US wanted to know anyone who had any experience uh, uh, in um, uh, any form of ball lightning uh, work in the whole world. And uh, they mentioned some of the people that <laughs> I've worked with, they mentioned, I think, the Avramenko work. They also say that shoulders work is probably one of the best ways to explore this. But they also talk about work that was conducted in the 1950s and 60s. Uh, but it's the only thing that uh, stays classified in that document. So I believe that this has been known for a very, very long time. And um, I, I think this is how Lena works. And uh, I think by the end of next week, uh, you guys should have a good understanding of how you can use uh, uh, electrostatic shields uh, as well as uh, other type of shielding, uh, uh, which I have discussed, and new types of shielding that I will lay the evidence for, so that we can work with this uh, type of technology 
with some degree of uh, surety on the safety. Um, but uh, there it is. So thank you very much for your time this week. I really appreciate all the comments I've had. If you have any comments on this, things that you want me to ask uh, uh, Klimov, uh, in respect of this work, please put them in the comments in the video below. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, I would seriously suggest you do that because it's going to get really, really interesting. And uh, if you find yourselves able to spare a few dollars here or there, um, there are links to be able to do that to support this research work. I've got some hugely exciting announcements to make uh, moving into the year. And uh, I think uh, s some mysteries about various... Um, uh, energy systems will be uh, <laughs> demystified and uh, it's just it's just such a pleasure to be able to share this with you so thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video